Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many of you here this morning. I hope you're all nicely caffeinated. My name is Megan Barkdell, and I'm excited to share some of my work today exploring how a single genome can produce multiple phenotypes in ants. So I study the turtle ants, the genus Cephalodes, which as you can see are these really neat arboreal twig nesting ants. They have a ton of interesting traits. So across many species in the genus, you'll find individuals with this kind of large, flattened, disc-shaped head, which they use super effectively in nest defense, as you can see here. Also in the genus, you'll see that they tend to have this kind of flattened body plan, which actually allows them to glide back towards the tree trunk if they fall in their arboreal habitat. So you can see, compared to that control-dropped object on the left, that the cephalodes ant is able to glide back towards the tree trunk. So in addition to calling them turtle ants, we could call them flying or gliding ants. Now, despite both of the individuals on the screen being members of this same genus, as we just discussed, they have pretty distinct morphologies. So that individual on the left not only has the characteristic disc-shaped head, but she's also much larger than that smaller individual on the, on the right who lacks that disc-shaped head. And yet, these are actually both members from the same species. So these are both Florida turtle ants. Not only are they members of the same species, but they're actually both worker individuals from a single nest. And not only are they workers from a single nest, but they have identical genomes. And I think that's a really remarkable fact, right? Somehow development is taking two genetically identical eggs, which hatch and grow as seemingly identical larvae, but via plastic development, they pupate into these quite radically different morphologies and ultimately a close as fully differentiated adults with distinct behaviors and roles in the nest. So this phenomenon of worker polymorphisms that are produced via developmental plasticity is just one example of a polyphenism, or the production of multiple discrete phenotypes from a single genome in response to environmental or other external inputs. Polyphenisms are pretty widespread across the tree of life, and we know that they're often adaptive. So other examples include many butterflies, which can produce discrete wing patterns in different seasonal conditions. Hopefully you saw Noah Brady's talk about this butterfly yesterday. Sex determination in some reptiles, where the same genome can produce either a male or a female, depending on the temperature experienced during development. And an example that I really love are the spadefoot toads, which under crowded conditions develop into these larger tadpoles with really robust mandibles that allow them to engage in cannibalism, which is what you're seeing in this photo. Now, all of these striking polyphenisms really raise the question, how? How does one genome produce two or more phenotypes? And I'm interested in thinking about this question from both proximate uh, perspectives, thinking about developmental mechanisms, and also from more ultimate evolutionary perspectives. Now, this is, of course, quite a complex question. And today, I'll show you how my work begins to address it using a combination of developmental transcriptomic approaches and comparative genomics. Yeah. Don't know why my PowerPoint's not working, but bear with me. Well, with the idea being that by combining these different approaches and lines of evidence that you can't see on the screen, we can begin to identify some of the underlying mechanisms that actually produce this trait. So for the first part of the talk, I'm going to focus on that one species, on the Florida turtle ant, and take a look at what's going on in pupil workers and pupil soldiers, since this is the earliest life stage where we can really unambiguously distinguish these different morphs. I can then extract and sequence RNA from these pupae and assess patterns of differential gene expression. So we can look at these results at a broad scale using a volcano plot, which is going to have the magnitude of differential expression on the x-axis. If a gene's on that left side, it's more highly expressed in pupil minor workers, and if it's on the right side, it's more highly expressed in those pupil soldiers. The y-axis is indicating the significance of that differential expression, and then individual points are also colored by a p-value cutoff. So you can see we have roughly 1,100 genes that are more highly expressed in those worker pupae, and about 650 that are being upregulated in pupil soldiers. How do we kind of make sense of these thousands of differentially expressed genes? Well, one option would be to explore which well-characterized molecular pathways are overrepresented among our differentially expressed genes. So I'll present these results as a ridgeline plot, where each row is going to correspond to a different significantly enriched pathway, 
The x-axis is again representing that degree of differential expression, same kind of scale as before. And then the y-axis for each row is indicating the number of genes in a pathway with a particular level of differential expression. The plots are also gonna be colored by the significance of the enrichment. And so looking at these results, you can see we have 13 different pathways that are significantly enriched among my thousands of differentially expressed genes. Several of these pathways are related to either brain or synaptic processes, suggesting that there are probably neurological differences between the morphs. And this makes a lot of sense because they do differ quite dramatically in behavior as adults. I'm actually though particularly excited about this pathway in the middle, hippo signaling, because hippo signaling is thought to help integrate between whole body signals of nutritional condition with imaginal disc morphogen signaling networks to help create a number of different insect polyphenisms. So in these two different beetle species, which have either a nutritionally sensitive head horn or nutritionally sensitive mandibles, knockdown of components of the hippo signaling pathway actually interferes with the normal development of this polyphenic phenotype. And while we know that both nutritional signaling via insulin-like peptides and other mechanisms and the activity of imaginal discs individually are relevant to social insect morph differentiation, to my knowledge, this is the first time that hippo signaling has actually been implicated in this caste differentiation process in ants. And so it may be the case that as in these beetles, cephalodes are using hippo signaling to transduce the nutritional or other environmental inputs that actually mediate this morph differentiation process. And the slides are still not coming up. But since we want to understand the relationship between these kind of proximate developmental mechanisms that I just talked about and more ultimate evolutionary mechanisms acting across the genus, I've also taken a comparative genomic approach to understanding this polymorphism. Like none of the slides are coming up, so that's fun. So cephalodes ants are a really great group in which to apply these kind of comparative genomic methods. If you could see my phylogeny, you would understand why. Um, especially in these early diverging lineages that you can't see on the screen, we have species both with and without that soldier cast. And I've actually inferred that the soldier has likely evolved a number of times independently from a monomorphic ancestral state. And so in this project, Maybe if I go one more. Yeah. Okay, so I've selected a set, which you should be able to see a larger phylogeny, but a set of three different species, mon pairs of monomorphic and dimorphic species. So we've got these phylogenetically matched species where I can go in, sequence their genomes, and then identify groups of orthologous genes across the phylogeny that I can then test to see if there's evidence of either positive selection or a shift in the intensity of natural selection that's associated with this polymorphism. Then I'm gonna look at the overlap of the genes that are under selection in the dimorphic cephalodes species with those genes that were differentially expressed in cephalodes variants from the beginning of the talk. So first, what are kind of the distribution of these selective regimes across the genomes of my six species? We'll look at these results as two different bar plots. The first for positive selection, and the second for changes in the intensity of natural selection. Both of these plots are going to have selective regime running along the x-axis and the count of gene groups on the y-axis. Um, yeah, that's also not popping up. Okay. So what you should have been able to see is that there are hundreds to thousands of genes that are evolving in concert, concert with this polymorphism, either under positive selection in the dimorphic cephalodes, positive selection in those monomorphic cephalodes, or we have lots of evidence for changes in the intensity of natural selection that's associated with this phenotype. And so we can say, yes, there definitely is protein coding gene evolution going on in concert with this phenotype. But to better understand the sort of relationship between proximate developmental mechanisms acting in a single species, Encephalodes variants, and these more ultimate evolutionary processes that we're looking at across the group, I asked the question, are genes that are under selection also being differentially expressed? And so we have these two different sets of, of differentially expressed genes, those with minor biased patterns of expression and a smaller set with soldier biased patterns of expression 
And we can overlap those sets of genes with the sets of genes evolving under intensified, relaxed, or positive selection in my dimorphic species. Now, because we have six different intersections that we're really interested in, these data are not very well represented by a Venn diagram like this. So instead, I'm going to show you an upset plot, which has rows corresponding to our five different sets of genes. We have a bar plot that indicates how many genes are in each of those sets, and a matrix that represents the intersections of those sets using colored dots and lines. So for instance, in the second column, this is going to indicate the intersection of genes that are both minor biased in their expression and evolving under positive selection. So when we look at our results, along the top we have this bar plot that indicates how many genes are in each of these intersections. And you can see that there are generally fairly few genes in each intersection, between 158 and 18, depending on kind of which overlap we're looking at. And when we test each of these intersections to see if they contain more genes than you would expect purely by chance, only the overlap between minor biased expression and relaxed selection is statistically significant. And you can see that's a very marginally statistically significant p-value. So in general, no. Differentially expressed genes don't seem to be more likely to be under natural selection across this genus of ants. I think this pattern is really interesting if we sort of think about it in the context of both development and gene expression. So we know that the genome contains both protein coding genes, here in green, and regulatory sequences, here in gold, which help to recruit transcription factors and thus mediate gene expression. So the two lines of evidence that we've explored today are really picking up on different parts of this process. Differential gene expression between morphs is driven by gene regulation, whereas the comparative approach is capturing changes to the actual protein coding sequences of genes. Then if we think about the process of development, we often tend to think about development as involving earlier acting sets of genes that have regulatory and patterning roles, things like transcription factors, and more downstream effector genes, which could comprise things like structural proteins or pigment synthesis genes. And so I think that these two lines of evidence, right, are really picking up on these two different components of the morph differentiation mechanism. So to wrap everything up, today I've shown you that activity of the hippo signaling pathway may mediate ant worker polyphenisms. Natural selection linked to this polyphenism is acting on thousands of genes, which may be genes that are more downstream in these cast differentiation cascades. And together, these two lines of evidence are indicating that different kinds of genomic elements are likely involved in this phenotype at different levels, including regulatory sequences and protein coding sequences. With that, I'd like to thank my lab, my collaborators on these projects, the folks at the Cornell Insect Collection, and all the various funding sources that made this work possible. And I'll just end by sharing that I'm starting as an assistant curator of entomology at the LA County Museum this spring. So if folks are interested in working together or in putting together a postdoc proposal with me, please do reach out and you can find my website at that QR code. And with that, I think I have time for like one quick question. That's a great question. I personally tend to think of these really discrete dimorphisms versus these continuous polymorphisms that are often more size-based. My hunch is that they may involve distinct developmental mechanisms, but that's really a wide open question. And there are a ton of other great ant developmental biologists here at the conference who also think about these things who might be able to weigh in, but that's a really great question, yeah. And I'll pass it off to the next person. Thanks, guys. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how uh, phenotypic plasticity interacts with evolution in discrete traits. And my thinking here is framed by the overarching objective of understanding population responses to alterations of the environment that can move organisms away from optimal conditions and hence decrease survival and reproduction. Here, population outcomes will actually depend on the distribution of the key traits that mediate the link between the environment and fitness where some phenotypes can mitigate or avoid the negative impacts of environmental alterations. 
So different phenotypes will differentially affect survival and reproduction. This is natural selection, changing trait distributions within generations. And there may be an evolutionary response given underlying genetic variation causing long-term uh, changes in trait distributions. And last but not least, plasticity can interfere and change trait distributions on relatively short terms. And there may even be a selection and evolution of plasticity. So we need to dissect the interplay of all these components if we are to understand eco-evolutionary dynamics uh, of these kind of traits. Yet so far, most theoretical and empirical studies on this topic have focused on continuously distributed traits like size and mass, flowering date, metabolic rate, or thermal limits. But many key traits are expressed as discrete phenotypic alternatives, like movement versus philopatry, dormancy versus germination, reproduction versus non-reproduction, behavioral choices, etc. And these traits require a specific conceptualization of their quantitative genetic architecture, which can be rationalized under the threshold model. Here we assume that the trait is underlaid by a latent continuous variable term liability, which is a linear combination of genetic and environmental effects. And alternative phenotypes A or B are expressed depending on whether the liability is below versus above a certain threshold. So in this framework, if there is phenotypic selection, it is classically thought that it can only be directional. Indeed, either phenotype A has a higher fitness than phenotype B or the opposite. So within phenotypes, there is cryptic genetic variation, which is shielded from selection. But selection acting between phenotypes can result in the evolution of the liability either up or down. But uh, I'm going to show that this is certainly too simplistic as things get more complex due to plasticity. Here for a given genotype, the liability can change with the environment according to some reaction norm, which results in phenotypic plasticity as the liability crosses the threshold. Yet genotypes with the same slope but different elevations can show different levels of phenotypic plasticity. For example here, the red and orange genotypes show no phenotypic plasticity because they are too far from the threshold to cross it and hence switch phenotype. And this remains valid if the liability reaction norms are nonlinear. Even in absence of among genotype variation in liability plasticity, there may be emerging among genotype variation in phenotypic plasticity. In other words, strictly additive genetic and environmental variances in liability can result in genotype by environment variance in phenotype. Now, if you imagine these genotypes as individuals exposed to an environmental gradient through time, you'll be able to observe the individual variation in phenotypic plasticity and hence possibly estimate the G, the E, and the G by E variances. And you may even observe that selection on these phenotypic sequences can take different shapes. For example, pink individuals that switch phenotype they may have higher fitness, indicating selection for plasticity, and hence stabilizing selection on the underlying genetic variation in liability elevation. And here, selection could also be directional or disruptive or subtle forms in between. So overall, we have an inherent interplay of plasticity with genetic variation and uh, uh, selection which opens the door to complex eco-evolutionary responses of discrete traits. And we can apply these views to better understand what's happening in the wild. And I've done this with the key traits of seasonal migration versus residence in European shacks. My study population breeds on the Isle of May in Scotland, where a long-term monitoring program is run by colleagues from UKCH, and they mark hundreds of individuals every summer with colorings and in the winter, some individuals remain resident on the island while others migrate away. So colleagues from the University of Aberdeen joined the team of field workers to go along the coast and recite individuals where they are and hence phenotype them as residents or migrants. And then we analyzed this data with capture mark recapture models. And this allowed us to show that shags experience extreme 
winter storms causing mass mortality, but migration can provide shelter from those storms, which results in strong directional selection against residents. So let's envisage now migratory plasticity using the threshold trait model under a basic scenario with individual variation in liability elevation, but similar liability plasticity in response to winter progression. Some individuals start far below the threshold, so they never cross the threshold and they remain residents throughout the winter. Others start above the threshold, so they never cross and they remain migrants. And others start just a bit below the threshold, so at some point they cross and they switch from residence to migration, so these ones express plastic migration. And of course the phenotype is reversible, so individuals can repeat or switch their tactic between winters. And we do indeed observe these tactics in substantial proportion every winter in the data, and without modeling the liability, we find patterns of between winter plasticity that match the threshold model. And I won't present this, but I invite you to check these fascinating results in our papers. But instead, I will focus on survival selection, acting on these tactics, and accordingly on migratory plasticity. Here we have six non-extreme years grouped together versus three years in which winter storms occur. In females first, we see no clear survival differences in mild years. And in two storm years, we see strong directional selection from full residence to full migration. And in another one, we see strong disruptive selection whereby plastic migrants had the lowest survival. And now in males, in mild years, we see disruptive selection of small magnitude, suggesting a cost of plasticity. In the first storm years, we see again strong directional selection for full migration. In the next one, no clear evidence of survival differences. And in the third year, we see strong uh, uh, selection against full residents or perhaps even stabilizing selection. So we have strong variation in the strengths and shapes uh, of selection between years and sexes. And this has potential for driving complex evolutionary dynamics of the underlying liability elevations and accordingly of, migra of migration and migratory plasticity. And the next step then is to evaluate the potential for evolutionary responses to such selection. So I partitioned the variance in liability for migration with animal models using pedigree data. And we found some additive genetic variants indicating potential for microevolution of migration. We also found large permanent individual variants, mostly representing environmental effects lasting from plastic development during early life. And a fair amount of temporary environmental variants representing plastic responses to current conditions. But what does this mean in terms of the phenotypes that we can observe? To see this, uh, I have devised the solution to achieve back transformations from the liability variances to the phenotypic variances, and we retrieved a modest additive genetic variance, quite large permanent individual variance, and notable temporary variance. And now we have a new and substantial fraction which is due to emerging among individual variation in phenotypic plasticity. More precisely, we get E by E arising from interactions of environmental effects due to developmental and labile plasticity. That is that early life conditions generate variation in the elevation of the liability reaction norms for the response to current conditions. And we also get the G by E that I mentioned in, intro in introduction, which reveals how much genetic variation gets exposed to selection and hence may effectively fuel microevolution through the plastic expression of migration. Uh, to sum up, the plasticity of discrete traits has distinctive evolutionary properties, which are different from continuous traits. One striking property is that genetic variation in liability can inherently generate genetic variation in phenotypic plasticity. So any evolutionary change in liability can result in an evolutionary change in phenotypic plasticity. And in turn, through G by E interactions, phenotypic plasticity exposes genetic variation to complex forms of selection. And all these effects on the liability and the phenotype can be quantified. 
And as I've shown today, we're getting there with the shags. Uh, we are also now quantifying the multi-dimensional liability reaction norm in response to critical environmental factors. And we're heading towards estimating genetic variation in liability slopes. And my colleague, Rita Fortuna, who is uh, just here, has already estimated season-specific genetic variances. And she's talking about that tomorrow in the evolutionary ecology session number nine at 11.45. And in parallel, we are also putting all these complexities together into theoretical simulation models, showing the distinctive eco-evolutionary dynamics of migration that we get under the threshold model. But still, most of the theory on eco-evolutionary responses assumes uh, continuous phenotypic distributions. So now we really need deeper understanding with discrete traits, which are pervasive and critical in living organisms. So that's all for me today, and I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Yes? Are you talking about this variation on, in survival yeah. selection? Yeah. yeah, in fact, it's, it's only in one population. Right. Yeah, they, they breed sympatrically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we have also other populations, uh, and actually they reflect the variation that, that indicates, uh, I mean, regarding this for the, the, the plasticity, like the, the underlying variation in liability, we don't know yet because we haven't checked this in the other populations, but what we see in terms of the, the visible phenotype, just migration versus residence, we have like geographical gradients that, that uh, reflect the fact that the individuals that migrate north, actually they get sheltered from selection because they can, uh, because the, the storms are actually heading east and they are protected because they are in coves uh, that are indented and protected from the winds. So it's time for me to, to leave the, the stage for someone else. And my name is Isabel Nylon. I am a, an NSF postdoctoral uh, fellow working at Louisiana State University. Um, and today I'm really excited to share with you some of the work I've been able to do during my first year as a postdoc, looking at thermal tolerance and plasticity in Tigriopus californicus. So I think we all know that the ocean and the planet more generally is getting warmer. And this is happening both as a, a slow increase in mean temperature, but this is overlaid over a temperature mosaic that already exists in our world. And it's also happening in conjunction with anomalies, so heat waves, both terrestrial and marine. So not only is the mean increasing, but variance is increasing and unpredictability is increasing, and we're getting more of these pulses of extreme events. And so I'm really interested in understanding not just what, how an organism copes or adapts to a stress, but how it may carry forward in its life in these pulse events. Um, so meet the hero of our story, uh, Tigriopus californicus, or the splash pool copepod. Um, in this center picture, you can see what they look like to the naked eye. They are visible, but small, um, but small but mighty. They are really nice, tractable system for experiments. They have a short generation time. We can cultivate them in the labs. They're great for these types of questions. And importantly, um, when they, where they live in the field is in these splash pools or high uh, tide pools in the high intertidal um, that are shallow and exposed to whatever ambient temperature is happening. So you can imagine a shallow tide pool on a hot summer day in the sun can get quite warm quite quickly. So they naturally experience these pretty wide temperature ranges and these pulse events. It's already baked into their natural history. So imagine we have a, an adult copepod that experiences a sublethal heat stress. The question is, what happens as it moves forward in its life? Does that carry forward, perhaps in a negative way, lowering performance? Or, as we found in the system previously, there's actually this beneficial effect of prior stress, so a heat hardening or acclimation effect. So if adult copepod experiences sublethal heat stress, it actually increases their thermal tolerance when they experience that heat stress again. What's less known is how that may carry forward across life stages. So for all my terrestrial folks in the audience, the classic example of a complex life history is a caterpillar that metamorphoses into a butterfly. But this is actually an extremely common life history trait in the ocean. Everything from crabs to fish to snails to our very own copepod 
have these biphasic life histories where they start as a larvae and then transform into their adult form. So it's really interesting to think about what happens if a larvae is exposed to a stressor. They tend to be more vulnerable in most systems. This is a critical window for stress exposure. But interestingly, at least one paper in Tigriopus has found that this might not be the case. Larvae are actually more tolerant than their adult counterparts. So I was really excited to test this question in this system in particular. So we know if you experience a stress in your early life and it carries forward into adulthood, this is a form of developmental plasticity. But I wanted to know if we see that same acclimation pattern across life stages. And then I wanted to take it one step further in thinking about going across generations. So what happens if your parents are exposed to a sublethal heat stress? Does that carry forward to you as their offspring? And do we see that same beneficial acclimation pattern? In this case, this would be anticipatory parental effects. So more specifically, I wanted to know, does the timing of shock or that sublethal heat stress matter, early life versus adulthood? Do we see evidence for transgenerational plasticity in the system? It's not yet explored. And then the one I get most excited about is, is there an interaction between this within and transgenerational effect? And all three of these questions I'm going to ask through the lens of a population level comparison. So not just what are the patterns, but when do we see these patterns? And can that help us predict how these populations may or may not persist as our planet gets more and more unpredictable and variable? OK, let's start with the first question. So to answer this, we ran an experiment where we took adult animals from our lab cultures that have been raised for many, many generations in the lab, but were originally collected from two populations along the coast of California, the west coast of North America, one in the north and one in the south. And we chose these two populations because previous literature has shown that the southern population has a higher thermal tolerance overall, but lower plasticity, meaning that beneficial acclimation effect is less. Contrast to the north, where the, lower tolerance is, the thermal tolerance is lower, but we see higher plasticity. So that beneficial acclimation really helps them out in the north. All right, so we did what's called a split brood design. Um, here is a female with her um, brood of eggs. So we split each brood evenly across our treatments to try and control for some of the genetic variants we may have um, into our two treatments, which were a control and then a heat shock or a sublethal heat stress, so an hour at 34 degrees Celsius. And it's important to note that this was sublethal. This is not a selection event, but it is stressful for them. We then grew those individuals into adults and again uh, kept half in control and shocked the other half for a fully factorial design. And then the response variable I'm going to talk about today is LT50, or the temperature at which 50% of animals die. So this is just one way to measure thermal tolerance. So really, basically, what we did is we put copepods in a little PCR tubes. They're very convenient that way. Put them in a thermocycler. We can put them at a target temperature for an hour. We did that multiple times for multiple temperatures to create a dose response curve, essentially. And from that logistic regression, we can calculate this LT50 value. So that's what we're going to talk about today. All right. Um, we're going to look at a lot of reaction norm graphs. So let me walk you through what that's going to look like first. On our x-axis, we will have adult treatment, so control on the left, shocked on the right. And then larval treatment will be indicated by the color of the lines. Control will be blue, shocked will be red. On the y-axis, we have that LT50 value. So again, lethal temperature where 50% live, 50% die, and that's in degrees Celsius. And then we'll have our populations as panels. So the north will be on the left and the southern population on the right. And before I show you the exciting data, I'm just going to walk through some possible responses we'll look for and what that looks like graphically. So one option, we could see adult effects but no larval effects. So we see a slope to this line. This is telling us that adults that had that shock have a higher thermal tolerance. But the blue and red lines are right on top of each other. There's no larval effect in this case. Conversely, we could see larval effects but no adult effects. So now the lines are horizontal. There's no slope to them. But they've separated and they're doing slightly different things. Perhaps a little more interestingly, we could get adult and larval effects. So there's a slope to the line and they're separated. And then we could also get an adult by larval treatment interaction. So we're looking for that intersection or cross of lines. OK, let's look at some real data. Um, first thing to notice is that our southern population indeed has a higher thermal tolerance than our northern population. Second thing to notice is that they are doing different things. The patterns are slightly different. So let's look at each individually. First, in the south. This is a classic adult effect, so adult acclimation, without any difference between our red and blue lines, so no larval effect. Conversely, in the north, we see an adult by larval treatment interaction, so these lines are crossed. And just a couple things to point out. One is we actually do see a larval uh, beneficial acclimation effect, 
But this was only true in adults that themselves were not shocked, so in our control adults. So when we look over here, that pattern disappears. And what this results in is in larvae that did not receive a shock, we see that classic adult acclimation pattern. But the line flattens out and we lose that effect when the larvae themselves were shocked. So overall, we see different patterns across our two populations, but it seems to be that you can either have a larval or an adult effect, but you can't have both. So it does not benefit you to be shocked twice. Okay, so we've looked within a generation. Now let's think about across generations. Again, we took the same individuals from our lab cultures, same two populations we just talked about. Um, we created an F1 generation and this time reared them to adulthood before sublethally shocking them just like before and then had them create an F2 generation where we shocked them as larvae and as adults for a fully factorial design. And then once again, we're gonna look at LT50 values of these F2 adult animals. All right, there's even more moving pieces in this one, so just to orient you to this, again, adult treatment is on the x-axis. This time it's gonna be F2 adult treatment. Line color is again larval treatment, F2 larval treatment in this case. On the y-axis, we have LT50, again in degrees Celsius, and we'll have our north on the left and south on the right. Last piece of this puzzle is the parental uh, of treatment. So we'll have control on the left, shocked on the right. Okay, here's all the data together. There's a lot going on. So I'm just gonna walk you through some of the highlights. Um, starting with the control parents in the north. Again, this is, should be a familiar pattern. This is the adult acclimation effect. And this is actually different than the other three uh, population by treatment combinations we see. Um, the magnitude is slightly different, but the pattern is similar. So in larvae that were shocked are red lines. We see this acclimation effect. There's a slope to the line, but we don't see that in larvae that lack that shock. And when we look specifically at shocked parents, um, it's a little more pronounced in the north than the south, but qualitatively we see a similar pattern, which is that for this particular treatment combination, so parents that are shocked, larvae that are shocked, but then miss that shock in adulthood, it actually lowers their thermal tolerance. And we're not totally sure exactly what's happening here, but when we take it all together, we have an emerging hypothesis, which is that there may be a saturation of this beneficial acclimation, meaning that it does not benefit you to get shocked all three times. It really is about when you're shocked and what the particular combinations are. And to get at this hypothesis a bit better, we are going to do a transcriptomic analysis. The data for our F1s just came in last week, so I could not prepare it in time for this talk, unfortunately. Um, but we're hoping that we can actually get at potential transcriptional front loading or some other mechanisms that may support what we're seeing in the phenotypic data. All right, so just to zoom back out of the weeds a little bit and wrap up, um, what did we learn? So this acclimation effect we're seeing has concrete fitness benefits. We measured survival as our response variable. We see that the northern and southern population had different patterns, suggesting the potential for local adaptation of these plasticity patterns. The timing of the stress did in fact matter. So we saw really interesting but complicated interactions between larval and adult treatments. And that we did in fact see carryover effects that span both life stages and generations. And taken all together, this is just some pieces to the puzzle in trying to understand population persistence in our changing world. Um, namely, that evolutionary history with a given stressor is critically important, but also the near-term history with that stressor and when it's occurring in their life history patterns is important to consider. Um, so with that, I'd really like to thank everyone who made this possible. Um, in particular, the Kelly Lab taught me everything Copapod related. I was brand new to the system. I'm learning to love it. Um, <laughs> and with that, I would thank you all for being here, and I, if I have time, I'll take questions. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, asking about these, if they're like ephemeral pools, essentially, if they dry up, if these tide pools, I'm sure it does happen. Um, I think there's an interesting metapopulation kind of question here um, that I don't specifically address, but what we seem to think is there are these deeper, bigger pools and then kind of these outlying smaller pools that are more sto stochastic, not just in terms of drying up, but even you know oxygen and temperature, things like that. Um, and it seems like they are sinks for the population, and then those deeper pools are continuing to provide a source. Um, so what we know from other work that is not mine, but um, 
these populations are really locally adapted, like they have strong signal, but they tend to be pretty, um, there's not a lot of adaptation within a site. So the pools tend to be pretty similarly in terms of genetics. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. I mean, and adaptive is like a, is a loaded term in this conference, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, the fortunate part about being in this system is that there's a lot of literature that comes before me. I'm standing on other folks' shoulders. Um, there's been a lot of work looking specifically at local adaptation, the genetics, the transcriptomics. So we know um, that there's definitely differences between these populations, and I knew that going in, which is why I'm very hesitant to give sweeping statements about when I'm using two populations, right, rather than a paired thing. Um, but we have paired sites where we have data outside of this experiment that they behave very similarly. Um, yeah, it's, you know, in the south, the temperature tends to be warmer. So these copepods were taken from San Diego versus just north of San Francisco for anyone, if that means anything to folks who are in the California area. Um, so overall, the temperature is higher. Um, and in the north, it tends to be more variable, right? So those are perfect conditions for uh, promoting evolution of plasticity. Um, so yeah, I, I could talk to you for an hour about all of that. It's a great question. But we have I can some background literature that helps me answer those questions. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. So in, in case uh, folks didn't hear, the, it, would it be a different pattern if they're getting the same number of shocks but within a life stage versus across? Well, oh, I don't know the answer to that. It would be a great follow-up experiment. Um, yeah, I, I don't know the answer. I think there is something about this larval phase. I'm, I'm really intrigued to dig in more. The fact that they seem to be more tolerant as larvae than adults tells me oh, I'll jump off the stage. But we can talk later. That's a great question. <laughs> Good morning and hello. My name is Allison Nalesnik. I am a PhD candidate at Purdue University. Um, today I'll be sharing a snippet of one of my chapters for my dissertation looking at insights into temperature adaptation uh, by comparing uh, patterns of gene expression across different uh, Daphne Pulex clones. And so, as we know, um, we're in a warming climate um, in many regions around the world will be challenged by increased average temperatures and increased frequency of warmer and colder days, increased variability in daily temperatures, and as such, individuals and populations um, have a variety of mechanisms at their disposal to respond to a changing environment. One of those is that they may move to suitable habitat as observable with um, range expansions or shrinkages. Species may adapt, or individuals, populations may adapt in place as they are able, they may modify their daily behaviors to be active at specific times of the day that is most suitable uh, to their temperature tolerances. And they may modulate their gene expression. And by this, I mean that individuals can change their gene outputs. Either they make more of a gene output or reduce um, the production of a specific gene, excuse me, um, such to facilitate their survival um, in a specific environment. And this is what I will be touching on today. And to look at uh, patterns of gene expression, I'm using Daphnia. Specifically, I'm using Daphnia pulex. Um, they are a freshwater planktonic crustacean, fairly cosmopolitan around the world with over 200 species, um, largely characterized by different morphology and habitats. Um, and they are a model organism. They're small, very convenient to take care of in lab. But interestingly, they have a great uh, reproductive um, mechanism such that they are facultatively parthenogenic. So they may switch between sexual and asexual reproduction dependent on uh, hormone clues and environmental cues as well. So when they complete asexual reproduction, they produce parthenogenic daughters. And these daughters distinctly are genetically identical to that parent. So we can then go into the environment and sample a local pond um, and collect a wild animal and such propagate them in the lab to generate multiple individuals that are genetically identical to one another. 
And this is great. So from one animal, we can have thousands if your heart desires. And so in lab, we can um, essentially breed uh, multiple, or we can grow populations of genetically identical individuals. So noted here, I have um, four distinct clones um, grouped by color, clones one through four. And having multiple lines in lab enables us, and multiple individuals, enables us to ask some interesting questions. First, like what are the different genetic responses between these clones in response to temperature? So this is looking um, between um, different clones, like comparing clones one and four. How are they responding differently to a temperature stress? And in addition here, because again, we have multiple individuals that are genetically identical, we can get at what are the plastic responses within a clone in response to temperature. So this would be comparing within clone one, within clone three, um, how is that clone uh, responding plastically? And by plastic, I mean that many phenotypes can be derived from the same genotype. And the phenotype I'm talking about here specifically is gene expression. So that upregulation or downregulation, producing more or less of a specific gene product um, in response to their environment. And so I sampled uh, multiple ponds around northern Indiana for distinct genetic clones. I brought those clones into our lab. And before getting started with experiments, we need to conduct what is called maternal lines. And this um, operates to to remove the influence um, from their environment while we have them in lab. And so bringing the wild animal in from the field, our first generation in lab, the F1s, um, control for the environmental effects of their parents. And consecutively, um, with tracking and isolating all of those individuals, we control for maternal effects and grand maternal effects as well. And this is required such that the environment um, or nutrient availability, the temperature exposure of the grandmother can affect the gene expression of the granddaughter. So we propagate out multiple generations in lab um, to really be able to isolate out um, the genetic and plastic responses that we're looking for uh, distinguished between those clones. Um, so I did this for all six of our clones, um, such that using these um, F4 experiment animals, um, we had two temperature conditions um, for a sublethal temperature stress exposure. Our control was at 20 degrees Celsius, our ambient laboratory temperature, um, and we had 25 degrees Celsius um, as a sublethal temperature stress. And so I had multiple individuals from each clone here noted by circles um, and by color um, within each of these large tanks. And we had five replicates of our control and five replicates of our experiment. Um, so I had upwards of 1,000 animals across this experiment as individuals, um, and I exposed them to the sublethal temperature stress for up to seven days, and I isolated individuals on day four and day seven to capture a more short-term response to temperature and a long-term response at seven days. Um, I completed um, whole RNA extractions for 180 whole individuals individually, so I did not pool my samples. Um, 90 from each day and split, of course, between control and treatment. And then I completed RNA sequencing. And so to jump right into some results, well, analysis first and then results, as always. So first analysis, um, I wanted to identify those differentially expressed genes that I talked about. What genes are they upregulating or downregulating in, in response to temperature? And with this program, I was able to do two unique models, um, such as shown here. Model A uses clone as a fixed effect in temperature as the response variable. So this is capturing genes that are solely responsive to temperature um, regardless of clone. And so an example is shown here with heat shock proteins, which are uh, differentially expressed in response to many different kinds of stress. Um, and we would see here for an example that heat shock proteins are upregulated in our treatment group relative to our control group. And with this program as well, I did an additional model, noted model B here, where I included clone and temperature as both fixed effects. And instead, our response variable is the interaction between clone and temperature, which enables us to identify genes for which the effect of temperature varies by clone. And so again, my example here is heat shock proteins. And we can see that, sure, all of these clones upregulated heat shock proteins in response to temperature stress, but they do so in different ways um, at least in different magnitudes. And so now jumping straight into results. Um, first, reviewing our first model, genes that are solely responding to temperature. On day four, we had 264 differentially expressed genes. 
And we see a large increase by day seven that genes responding to temperature, we have 664 differentially expressed genes. We see an inverse relationship with our second model, such that we see way more on day four, 710 differentially expressed genes um, that are varying by clone, and then a decrease by day seven uh, with 146 differentially expressed genes. So I'll touch on this inverse relationship in a few slides, but first to um, review what some of these differentially expressed genes are. Um, I'll be reviewing for the Model B, so those genes that are, uh, have a varying response um, by clone um, to that temperature exposure. And so on day four with 710 differentially expressed genes, we see broad, um, I used gene ontology, um, which categorizes, um, categorizes genes under um, different umbrellas of terms, and there's different tiers like parent terms, and it gets more specific um, as you go lower in the gene ontology hierarchy. And so some broad uh, parent terms that we see standing out here um, on day four include different metabolic processes, system development, regulation of localization, um, and intracellular signal transduction. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. So um, also noted here, those sides of the circles indicate the genes um, that group under those parent uh, gene ontology terms. So with these broad terms, I then um, looked at specifically differentially expressed genes, and here I'm sharing just those that were very upregulated, and they're more, there are more, um, this is not exhausted list. Um, but these are, are greater than 30 log two full change, which is quite extensive. Many of them on day four have to do with structure, such as those dealing with the cuticle, the eye lens, and chitin binding. Um, but there are also some heat shock proteins, which again is validating, but unsurprising as those are uh, differentially expressed in response to many different kinds of stress. Um, we also see some membrane proteins as well. So that was day four. And now moving into day seven, some broader gene ontology terms that really, that can describe that group of differentially expressed genes on day seven. We see cellular component organization, again, metabolic processes, and some different metabolic processes as well that I'll be looking um, deeper into those hierarchies um, in autophagy of peroxisomes. To highlight some specific genes, we do see some shared, such with the cuticle um, and chitin, um, those associated with structure. But we also see um, some transglutamase-like superfamilies to do with protein processing, protosome stabilizing, um, and alpha carbonic uh, anhydrase, so having to do with protein um, degradation um, within cells. And so, shared between day four and day seven, as I mentioned, there are different structural components that are shared, but they are telling a distinct story right now as far as day four seems to majority be focused on structural components. Whereas on day seven, although there are still some structural components being differentially expressed, we see more to do with protein synthesis, peptide processing, um, and regulated protein degradation. So there are distinct stories being told here um, that I will further describe um, as part of my dissertation. And so I said I was gonna wrap back around to it. We see this distinct inverse pattern as far as where the majority um, of differentially expressed genes are. And so it's important to note here, within model B, we are capturing genes for which the effect of temperature varies by clone. Whereas on model, in model A, we're solely looking at genes that are responding to temperature. So the story we can then tell here is such that on day four, clones are responding more distinctly from one another, very different from one another. Um, they may be sharing some pathways, but may be expressing to different magnitudes. Whereas um, by day seven, they are converging on more similar pathways of response to that temperature stress. And so to wrap up quickly here, um, as I said, Daphne and Pulex clones are responding differently. Um, on day four, and more similarly on day seven, which does suggest a convergence on uh, a similar response to temperature stress um, prolonged at day seven. Ongoing analysis is diving deeper into that gene ontology hierarchy uh, beyond those broad parent terms within those groups as far as you know, um, better, visualiz better visualizations for what those genes are. Um, I've also done WGCNA networks, which is describing networks and groups of co-expressed genes um, that I look forward to sharing at a later time. I'd like to thank my PI, Mark Christie, different collaborators at Purdue, uh, Catherine Searle, Nathan Backenstos, Peter Euclid, my undergraduate support for doing this experiment, and my funding from NSF. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>
from distinct um, ponds. So Daphne and Pulex are found in unstratified waters, so generally more shallow ponds uh, versus lakes. Um, Can you repeat your question? Mm -hmm. Yes. We have called SNPs, um, and I didn't show like PCAs here as far as how distinct those populations are. Um, they are fairly distinct from one another, but they are um, in the realm of things grouped to northern Indiana ponds. Um, so they have experienced um, in their history similar um, temperature and environmental conditions, um, but they are very distinct from one another. That answers your question.